right, well, I'm very glad to see uh, such a good turnout for, for this. Um, welcome to session, I want to say 17, mm -hmm. because this is the fifth year of um, this Philosophers in the Midst of History sequence. And so each year we do, in the spring we do a, a, a um, well, still part of winter right now, but spring we'll call it, we do an ancient philosopher. And then in the summertime we do a medieval philosopher or, or thinker. Um, and then we do uh, an er early modern, so like, you know, 16th, 17th, 18th century thinker. And then at the end of the year we do a 19th or 20th century thinker. And each of these is, a, you know, an interactive lecture where um, what I'm focusing on is that particular philosopher and how, how they're located in history. So what is the background? What was going on? How did that influence their works? How did that affect what they did? How did they sometimes get killed because of it? Like in the case of Boethius uh, a while back. And then I talk, about, um, I talk about some of their ideas as well, but then I also talk about why they influenced history, because it's, it's a two-way street. So Epicurus and the Epicureans, um, they were a really major school in antiquity, and they're, they're still around today. Interestingly enough, there's been a revival as of late and a new literature that's developed, which is quite cool. So we'll talk about that. And um, at any time, if you've got questions or you know, there's something that you want clarification about, go ahead and stop me and we'll, we'll continue in talking about that. Um, I gave you two things. One is a timeline that has what was going on with Epicurus and his life. There's not a lot we actually know about it, unfortunately. And then other things that were happening in Greece, and particularly in Athens, where Epicurus spent uh, a lot of his life and founded his, his school, the Garden. And then um, I, I also gave you a handout that ideally it would be stapled, but it's not. Uh, it's three pages, and that's something that I use for my, my classes when I'm teaching about Epicurus and Epicureanism. It gives you some of the basics of what Epicurean hedonism um, was all about. And I, I suppose I should begin right at the start by talking about something where there's, there's often a misunderstanding because of the way language has changed, right? So when I say Epicurean, what, what's the, like, the first thing that comes to mind? Food. Okay, food, and what, so that's one pleasure, right? And what kind of food is Epicurean? Good. Good food, okay. What else? What else would you associate with it? Kind of high class, yeah, high class right? Store. Foodie food, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe rich, uh, tasty. Okay, so there's that. And then what else do you associate with the, the term Epicurean? If you got the food, you're at the table. The food site, the website called it. Epicurious, right? Yeah. Um, you know, usually we think about wine or other intoxicants. So an Epicurean would be, you know, having fine wine with, with their food and courses that they appreciate. Probably not eating too much. They wouldn't be, you know, stuffing their face. They would go for quality rather than quantity. And, you know, there's, there's some of that in ancient Epicureanism. But Epicurus himself was probably a, a vegetarian um, he didn't indulge an awful lot. You know, he said that drinking wine, not that good of an idea because, you know, you get hangovers and it leads you to do dumb things. And, you know, so this gives you kind of an idea about what his idea of a good time was like. Um, somebody said, can I do anything for you? And he said, yeah, give me a little pot of cheese. That'd, that'd be nice. And then he, he would just snack on that. And um, So it's, it's not quite so... Uh, hedonistically sensual, the, the kind of philosophy that he was teaching. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. There were other people, there were plenty of people in ancient times who were really uh, into food and drink. You know, I, some of you may have looked at cookbooks from ancient Greek or even, even more so the Romans mm -hmm. and some of the crazy dishes they used to make. Or you read some of the literature and uh, about these feasts that they would have. Um, it was, uh, they, they really did know how to 
get the most out of food. As a matter of fact, there's some things that they ate to the point of extinction at one point or another. Um, which, you know, uh, that can happen with us as well, but, you know, that, that, that's a lot to do in ancient times, I think. Right? So the Epicureans weren't into that. They were into a life of pleasure, having as much pleasure as possible and as little pain. So we'll talk about, you know, what, what that looks like in just a bit. But let's start by, by talking about this guy, Epicurus, and some of the, the background. Um, he is born outside of Athens. He's born on a place called Samos to uh, Neocles and Carastrata, both of whom were uh, Athenian born, and his father, uh, Neocles, was an Athenian citizen. So that means that Epicurus is also an Athenian citizen, which is important because if you go to Athens, like Aristotle did later on, Aristotle was not an Athenian citizen. Not being a citizen means you can't actually own land. There's all sorts of other things that, that you're uh, precluded from because of that. Epicurus is, is essentially a person living in a colony of Athens in a different place. And so he's going to go back to Athens after a while. And Athens is where um, philosophy wasn't quite born, but where it really took off. So you, you look at some of the things that are happening in the you know, 60 or so years leading up to Epicurus being born in 341. Um, Socrates dies. Uh, you know, I think all of you know about his trial. Um, he, you know, there's different reports of it. It looks like he may have kind of thrown it a bit. Uh, if you go by the apology that, that Plato writes, uh, but he's probably going to get convicted anyway. And that's, in, that's just right after 400 uh, B.C. Of course, they're not you know, counting B.C. or anything like that, but it's 399. And then um, some schools start getting founded. Plato founds his school in 387. Isocrates fi founds a school of rhetoric in Athens in 392. Um, somebody, you know, in, in the, the three... Um, 80s and 3, 370s and 360s, you have Aristotle being born, Democritus, the great Greek philosopher that Epicurus is going to draw upon dying, and then Antisthenes the Cynic. Antisthenes would have been a contemporary of Plato, a student of, of Socrates just like Plato was, as was another person, Aristippus. I probably should have put him on, on here as well, because Aristippus was one of the first hedonist philosophers, the first pe person to actually say, the whole goal of life is to have a good time, and here's how you do it. And he had a different way of, of uh, understanding it than Epicurus would. So you've got all these, these people, you know, um, sort of shuffling off the scene, having made their contribution uh, by the time that, that Epicurus is born. Uh, about six years before that, Plato dies, and his, his nephew takes over the academy in Athens. So by the time that Epicurus is around, and especially by the time he's a young adult, there is this tradition of having schools of philosophy, and they're centered in Athens. You can go to other places, but that's the main, that's the main location. And you know, another key thing that's happening at that time that affects the Epicurean philosophy is the Greek city-states are ceasing to be the main political game in town, you can say. Um, you're all you know, familiar with the Peloponnesian War, right? Where, who, who, who are the, the two main antagonists in that, that story? The two big cities? The, the, you know, in World Civ, this is the thing that they make you memorize, Athens and Sparta, right? And they represent two different ways of life. You know, the Spartans are authoritarian, but they're also, you know, able to, like, be unified militarily. The Athenians, democracy, but they have a very hard time, like, you know, getting things done. And then what they leave out of the story when they say that is that pretty much everybody else in Greece is stuck winding up on one side or another, and it spills over into all sorts of other areas. It spills over into Asia Minor, spills over into Sicily, and it, you know it goes it goes on for quite a while. Um, eventually, uh, you know Athens grows to become so big they call it the tyrant city, 
And you know, it, when, when the Spartans look like liberators, which is what they were called at, at one point, you know the Athenians have really screwed up. And they, they have, you know, as the old story with Greek, right? You have hubris, and then you have the fall, right? And that happens to Athens. They get, the city gets sacked and all of that. And what they're doing is they're spending an awful lot of time and energy on these struggles with each other, struggles that are reflected in their politics and their economies and all that. And meanwhile, um, there's this, well, there, there's a couple powers growing up north. Before Macedon becomes the big game in town, there's another city that became very important, and they managed to beat the Spartans in battle, like on the field of battle. That was Thebes. And so you, you start getting all these alliances and all of these leagues, they call them, of these city-states, where some of the city-states, like Athens or Sparta or Thebes, they, they can kind of run the show, and then the rest are kind of stuck along for the ride. They get to be allies, Sometimes being an ally is more like being like a henchman almost or a sidekick. You don't really have a lot of agency. And, you know, all of that stuff eventually sorts itself out. And the Persians are over to the east this entire time sort of laughing at these stupid Greeks and what they're doing. But they'll also hire the Greeks as mercenaries for their own dynastic struggles as well. So eventually, uh, another kingdom which, you know, the, the Greeks down in the south considered really only about half Greek, uh, but it was authentically, you know, Hellenic. Macedon um, starts to take over. And so by the time that, that Epicurus is, um, you know, in his childhood, Philip of Macedon takes over most of Greece. He defeats Athens and Thebes, two of the big cities there. He forms the League of Corinth. And then he's assassinated in 336 uh, BC. And at the time that he's assassinated, he was preparing for a big thing. He was going to get ready to invade Persia. And so his young son, Alexander, who we all know as Alexander the Great. Yeah, and in the Middle East, he's known as Alexander the Terrible to a lot of people still but he's known as Alexander the Great in the, in the West, he takes that war machine that has been put together, and he, he, he's also very charismatic, very dynamic. He invades uh, the Persian Empire, and for about the next 20 years, he's chasing the uh, uh, various Persian forces all up and down uh, the Middle East and North Africa. He takes over Egypt fairly quickly. Um, he, he does defeat you know, the Persian emperor, but that isn't the end of the story because there's still, you know, local governors, satraps they were called, who have their own forces and he has to fight them. He goes all the way to India. And, and you know, I think many of you know the story about what happens there. His troops, who've been marching now for 20 years, are kind of sick of it. <laughs> you, know? you think about our military commitments. People have been, you know, talking about how in Afghanistan, which is where Alexander was, um, we've now reached the point where uh, young soldiers who deployed at that time could actually have kids who are now deploying because we've been there for, for so long. Well, Alexander just had these guys around for that, that entire time. And, you know, some of them would be more recent. They'd have come from Greece at, at other times. But, you know, that, that's a long time to follow somebody on these campaigns. Um, by the time that he, by the time that that happens, Epicurus is in Athens. Um, he'd, he'd studied under this, this Platonist, Pamphilus, for four years as a young man. And then by the time that he's 18, they send him <coughs> off to Athens. Um, we're not actually quite sure what he was doing there. It may have been military service. It may have just been uh, going there as a citizen. And uh, Alexander then dies at that, that year. And the Macedonian Empire, they start to figure, well, what are we going to do with this gigantic entity uh, that's, that's now under Macedonian rule? And, and the, there's, you know, he left a son, and he had a wife, um, but the son is extremely young. And so you have a regent, and then you have these different, um, you could call them governors or generals, whatever you want to call them. <clears throat> Nowadays, we typically call them the diadokoi, the successors. 
And they're eventually going to start splitting the empire up between them. For Greece, it's more or less going to be Macedon ruling what's what's you know in south of it in, in Greece, and then you know Persia itself will be taken over by Seleucus and his dynasty, Egypt by Ptolemy and his dynasty, and then there's a few other things here and there, and they they fight over it. Um, <clears throat> but what it means is from you know the I was saying the Greek city state eventually became not not that important. Um, on a grand political scale, like setting your own policies, after you know twenty years of this, there there isn't any independence. You know, you're under whoever happens to have taken you over, and so you know the the things that previous generations had had going, where they could say, well, what is our city going to do? It's more like what we live with today, right? Uh, we're in the state of Wisconsin. And we can set our own policies for some things, but we're part of a much larger unity. And it's not like we can say, well, we don't like what the federal government's doing. We're going to secede and go our own way and figure it all out. Um, Wisconsin actually did threaten to do that at one time shortly before the Civil This is total trivia. The, the, before the Civil War, a lot of people don't know that our governor, uh, uh, Randall Alexander, I think it was his name, sixth governor of Wisconsin, if Lincoln didn't win, he threatened to have Wisconsin secede from the Union. So it wasn't just southern states saying that they were going to secede. It was um, northern states, too, if things went the other way. Um, didn't happen, you know. And there probably would have been quite a big battle if, if they had done that. But, you know, um, it's not really that much of an option for us, right? And it wasn't much of an option for ancient Greek city-states, either. Athens did, in fact, revolt, and that revolt was crushed almost immediately in um, uh, a very short war. Um, and so, you know, Epicurus is, is now coming up within a, you could say, a matrix in which people are still very interested in doing things, but politics isn't, isn't so important anymore, or at least grand, you know, we could call it grand strategy politics, politics of what your whole city is going to do. It's more like if you go into politics, you'd be somebody who's going to help manage things, you know? Let's make sure that the, the games get played right, and, um, if you know, once they actually have uh, things like aqueducts, now there's the ancient Greece, and not, Rome is going to have to come in before that, but, you know, the kind of making sure those projects go along correctly. Taxes get paid right. So Epicurus, um, you know, he does have a few things to say about politics, but not an awful lot. And the Epicureans themselves have been largely disengaged from that. So Epicurus, while all this is going on, and while, you know, sort of schools are d developing and changing hands, he travels to a few places. He studies with this... Um, this philosopher, uh, for a short time, uh, Nausiphanes, uh, learns about Democritus from him, sort of out, you know, out, outruns his usefulness very quickly and, and breaks from him. And then Epicurus um, rejoins his family. This, this, the people from Samos had been relocated to Colophon. Um, again, you know, dynastic uh, issues in, in the Macedonian Empire. And so he, he's there, and then he goes to a place called uh, Mytilene, which is on the island of Lesbos. He's teaching there for a, a fairly short time. Again, we don't know the full story, but apparently what he was teaching did not go over well, and he had to get out of town. And so he, he relocates to uh, Lamp uh, Lampsacus. And there he meets a lot of the people that are going to eventually go with him to Athens and help him. Uh, in, in starting a, a school. So in 306, a very important time, he returns to Athens, and he uses some money to purchase a garden. And, you know, a garden, sort of, think of like an estate, right? Um, this big area that's kind of walled off, and he establishes, he's been teaching already, he's been teaching the Epicurean philosophy, and he's got followers. Now he's got a place for his followers to go and practice this, this life together. So he, he teaches philosophy there. Um, not too long, 
uh, after that, um, you see some of these, these other, you know, philosophers dying off and schools again changing hands. Um, Crates the Cynic would be uh, somebody who's, who's kind of important as a uh, marking a certain time because he was going to he was the teacher of one of the other really important founders of the school, Zeno, the person who founded the Stoic school. The Epicureans and the Stoics became the two most important schools of, of late antiquity, and um, they were really rivals to each other in a way that we'll, we'll talk about in a bit. Um, so Epicurus then, you know, for the next essentially 36 years, he's, he's teaching in his place. He doesn't go anywhere. He doesn't travel. He just, you know, hangs out and lives a good life and does an awful lot of writing that I'll tell you about in a minute. And then in 270, he dies of a stone blockage of his urinary tract, and he names his friend Hermarchus as the successor as the scholarch. A scholarch is the person who runs the school. So each of the ancient... Uh, schools, and there were, there were a number of them, would have somebody who's like the, the guy, the, the person in charge. Um, he's the, the school arc of the Epicurean school, or they, he, they didn't call it the Epicurean school at the time, they just called it the garden, but he's in charge, so he gets to name his successor. He would have named a different guy, but that guy had died younger than, than him. Uh, his, his very close friend, uh, Metrodorus, um, yeah, he died in 278, so about eight years before Epicurus. Um, otherwise, you know, he would have been the successor. Now, uh, I mentioned that, that uh, he wrote a lot. Epicurus was one of the most prolific authors of antiquity, and we have almost none of what he wrote. So there's, there, I'll tell you first, give you an idea. I'm not going to like read off the entire list of what he wrote. It's in Diogenes, Laertes, Lives of the Philosophers, Book 10, if you're really interested in it. He wrote a book called On Nature in 37 books. A book was a scroll. So just to give you an idea about how long of a text that would be, if you have, have, some of you have read Plato's Republic, right? That's 10 books. Or Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics? 10 books. 37 books would be almost four times that. So that must have been one hell of a text to read. 30, it would be 37 scrolls that you would put into a bag that you would carry around with you. He also wrote, uh, I'll just read you a few of the titles of, of his, his books. On Atoms in the Void, a very important point of, of, of Epicurean natural philosophy. On Love, wouldn't it be interesting to have that book? Uh, against the Megarians. Okay, the Megarians were another school. This is a very common thing in ancient times to write against so and so, you know, why they're all wrong. Um, on choice and avoidance. Uh, on the gods. If we had that, we'd, we'd know more about the Epicurean theology. The banquet or the symposium. When we hear the word symposium, again, this is one of those words that's changed its meaning over time. So um, two of, of, of uh, Socrates' students wrote Symposia. Plato wrote one that's one of the greatest works of Western literature in which it's all about love, and they give these speeches, and you, you might have read it or, or you might not have. If you haven't, you, you should take a look at it. It's really quite good. Xenophon wrote another book called The Symposium about a different drinking party, which is what a symposium is, where Socrates has other conversations with people and actually almost gets in a fight with one of the entertainers. Um, Epicurus wrote a symposium, and we, we know that it's not just Diogenes Laertes telling us about this. Plutarch, later on, mentions it and tells us a bit about what's in it, but tantalizingly, you know, little, but it, it, it must have been quite a work. Um, essay on just dealing, you know, uh, opinions on the passions. Um, Essay on music. That would be interesting to, to, to t check out as well. He wrote uh, about 43 works, all told, not including um, some of the letters that, that he wrote as well. Now, we have, unfortunately, 
only five undisputed documents by, by um, Epicurus. We have three letters. There's another letter that's very short that may be by him, and then there's two sort of like best hits lists. Uh, they have different names. Uh, sometimes it's called sovereign maxims or, or you know, here uh, one translates fundamental propositions. The Greek is kuriai doxai, which means uh, beliefs or ideas or, or judgments and the ones that are the most important. The kuriai is the, the lord, you know, the, the, the ruler. And that's um, very short. And then they discovered one that's called the Vatican Sayings because they found it in the Vatican Library. Uh, the Vatican Library, this is another total side note. Sometimes there's conspiracy theories about, oh, the church is hiding this and hiding that. And it's, it's not the case at all. It's just such a mess and, and so disorganized that, like with many other old libraries, they often don't know what they have and things are mislabeled. And then you get a scholar going down in there and they'll open up a text and they'll be like, this isn't actually what's in the table of contents. What the hell is this? And then they read it a bit more. And if they've got the right background, they're like, oh my goodness, this is uh, this thing that, that has been lost for centuries. And, you know, somebody just misplaced it. <laughs> I actually had a professor who did that um, when he was a graduate student. He, he uh, went to the Vatican Library and he got a, a, an academic article out of this. He, he was paging through something, and I don't remember the exact details, and he found a couple pages that didn't fit, and he was like, well, I think this might be this, and he did a little bit of research, and he wrote an article and provided a translation of this text that, you know, they'd uh, put in the wrong place. <laughs> so so there's, there's something called the Vatican Sayings, which is about, you know, a good, good portion of it is actually just the same sayings as in the principal doctrines, but there's a few other cool things in there about friendship and justice and all of that. Now, it gets even more interesting. The reason why we have any of Epicurus's stuff is because Diogenes Laertes really thought he was interesting. He, he thought it was worth the time to copy down a few things by Epicurus just to give the reader an impression of what Epicurus had to say, and he copied it out line by line into his, his Lives of the Philosophers. Had he not done that, we wouldn't have any of those things. And nobody would have been able to recognize the Vatican sayings as, as what it was. So you might say, well, why did they lose all this stuff? Well, you know, when it comes to ancient works, we don't have any of Aristotle's dialogues. Um, he wrote dialogues that were supposedly as good as Plato's. Um, we probably have anywhere between 7 to 10% of the Stoic literature that was written. There's just a lot of stuff that's lost. We have nothing by the, by the Cynics, nothing by the Megarians. The only things we have are little fragments. It's just, you know, it's ancient literature. Um, it's rather unfortunate. We could discover some, some uh, lost texts, and there is a, a possibility of, of some of the texts at Herculaneum uh, that have been discovered as we're like you know going through them. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Maybe we'll find some new stuff by Epicurus in there. So that that could be kind of kind of cool. That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> so, in any case, what so what did the Epicureans actually think and and teach, and what was their way of life? I mentioned that it's it's all about pleasure and avoiding pain. So if you think about the things that, that we find pleasant, what are the things that most people, you would say, find what the, the Epicureans and ancient philosophers would call choice worthy, worthy of, of being pursued because they, they're pleasant? What do we get pleasure from? We mentioned food and, and, and wine. Wine we could think of as in terms of the taste, but also the intoxicating factor. So people also enjoy getting high in other ways, you know, uh, marijuana, um, hard drugs like meth and cocaine and stuff like that. So those are, you know, people like those because they're pleasurable, right? Um, our little kick of ca caffeine in the morning, that's, that's pleasurable. People smoke because uh, smoking is, you know, despite what the ads say, it is, it is fun. Um, and, you know, it doesn't taste that great all the time, but once you get used to it, you kind of get hooked. So there's all of those things. 
what, what are other things that people see as pleasurable? Intimacy. Yeah, so sexual pleasure, right? Um, and then there's also, you know, something that can come out of that. You mentioned intimacy, friendship, uh, affection of others, um, our reputations. You know, it's, it's nice to have people like you. It doesn't feel good when people are like, you're terrible, you know. Um, and we do that with social media, you know, post something. Uh, now, most things only allow you to put a like. They don't allow you to say, this is terrible. You know, some, some websites let you downvote things, um, but most, most don't. Um, but, you know, some people are very motivated by getting those, those virtual thumbs up or claps or whatever it happens to be. What else? What, what else do people enjoy? Sensory, like music or noise. Yeah. So all sorts of things appeal to that. Um, some, of, some of which may be dramatic in nature, you know, like, that's part of why we like to watch these TV shows. Um, I mean, some people like it as just background noise, and there might be a certain pleasure to that. But a lot of us watch shows because we, you know, we get caught up in the story. Um, and then, you know, we go to art museums and actually look at the paintings or sculpture. We go to uh, concerts, listen to the music. So there's a whole variety of things that we find pleasant. Laying in bed on a cold day under the warm blankets, that's a sensual pleasure, right? And so the Epicureans, they thought that if we want to manage our lives well and have the most pleasure as possible and the least pain, because if pleasure is the good, pain is the evil or the bad, and pain can cover a lot of stuff, then we have to, we have to understand the nature of pleasures. And so they made all these interesting distinctions. One of the distinctions is between um, bodily and mental pleasures. So if you think about um, what goes into appreciating a meal, right, for those people who are foodies. So there's, you know, you can, you can go to a nice fancy restaurant and get, I don't know, like a hundred dollar entree or something and just sit there and just shovel it into your face and you know, enjoy the, the feeling that's on your tongue very shortly and the feeling of uh, fullness. But that's kind of a bad management of pleasures, right? Because what are you supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be savoring it. Mm -hmm. And you know, the people who go to those restaurants, they often want to know, like, well, where did this, where did this uh, chicken come from? You know? And what are you doing to prepare it? Oh, you're using this you know, sauce. And, and so there's some intellectual stuff there, right? People who are like beer uh, fans, you know, they're, they're, oh, there's so many bitterness agents in this, and, or not agents, uh, uh, units, right? That becomes, oh, what hops? Is, I think I smell Cascade hops in this one, you know, with this IPA. And people can get very technical about this sort of thing. And, and it's, it's the same way with music, right? Um, you can distinguish, you can tell who really knows their classical music because you say, what do you think about Bach? And they're like, well, which piece, right? And then by which uh, performer? Oh, I really like, and I, I don't know enough about Bach, so I'll just make up names. I like the Smith performance of Bach's 18th concerto. And again, I'm just making stuff up. Um, I don't really like the Herbert one. I think he's you know, too forceful with the keyboard or something. That's all intellectual stuff, right? That's no longer just merely bodily or sensual. And Epicurus noticed something about bodily pleasures. So bodily pleasures, they're very short in duration. Even ones like laying in bed. I mean, how long can you lay in bed before you get tired of laying in bed? <laughs> um, and once the thing that's giving you the bodily pleasure goes away, that's, that's pretty much it for it. Mental pleasures can last a long time. I mean, can any of you think of like an experience that you had that was intensely pleasurable maybe 20 years ago? Can you call it up to mind? Not in perfect vividness, but you can reflect on it and then you can like enjoy it again. Now let's, let's do the opposite of that. Think about something that happened, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago and it was totally mortifying. Um, you were embarrassed in some way, and you're probably over it now. 
but you might still, if you were the sort of person to obsess about it, you could still be lingering over it, or somebody slighted you, somebody treated you badly 20 years ago, that SOB, you know, they're like long gone, they, you have no connection with them, but they're still there, as we say, in your head. Well, that's a mental pain, and that can go on the rest of your life if you, you allow it. So Epicurus noticed that, and he, he was in opposition to the other hedonists who said, the goal is to have as much physical pleasure as possible. Epicurus said, no, mental pleasure is really more important, and avoiding mental pains. The other thing he said, another distinction, is a little bit more technical. It's between what he calls, uh, we can translate it as moving and static pleasures or active and catastemic pleasures. So an active pleasure is like, say, drinking, drinking wine, right? You, you like the smell, if, if, do you all enjoy wine? Okay, so you're, you're smelling it, you're doing all the things you're supposed to do, you swirl it around, you look at it, right? Then you taste a little, take a little taste, and there's the, you know, it's a good one, and after a while you start to get buzzed. Um, all of those are what we call active pleasures. Um, but there's other things Epicurus said, and you might not buy this, but this is something that they were very insistent on. There's other pleasures that result from not doing something, but taking something away. So like when you're really cold outside and you come in and sit by the fire and warm up, that's a static pleasure. That's a catastemic pleasure. It's not an active pleasure. Um, you're just taking away a, a pain. When you're like just resting, when as we say, you know, chilling out, right? Or hanging out or something like that, like he's doing in the garden, and you're not really doing much of anything, but you're just enjoying yourself. He said that is actually more pleasant than like getting drunk or having sex or any of these sorts of things. And he was, well, maybe he's wrong about that, but there is definitely something to <laughs> making the distinction, right? Um, sometimes, he, he actually says, people have it wrong. They think that there's pleasure over here and pain over here and then a state of neither in the middle, a state of rest. This is what Aristippus thought. Epicurus says, that is where the real pleasure lies. And so as an Epicurean, your goal would be to have these kinds of pleasures, the, the middle, you know, intense because they're essentially resting pleasures that can go on for a long time, and as, as many of the other pleasures that are more active as you can, you can have without screwing things up for yourself. Like obviously you can't get drunk all the time or you can have a lot of pain and removing as many pains as possible. That's the good life. Everything else, you know, is important insofar as it leads to that. But that is the good life. And that's what his uh, followers thought and taught. And that's what they practiced. And they lived together in this garden. Of course, they would go outside and do shopping and things like that, right? And they did have kids. He, he didn't. But he, he, uh, in his will, he mentions, okay, I want this person taken care of, this person. Um, one of, one of uh, his followers actually named his kid Epicurus after him. <laughs> so so they're obviously, some of them are doing that. But they're, they're all practicing this, this life together as something almost like a sect, you know? And the, the word that we often translate as sect in, in Greek, uh, in a religious context, it was used for sects of philosophers, hierasis. It means to, to take. Uh, it's the word that we get heresy from later on, right? You choose something. You choose a deliberate way of life, what we nowadays would call an intentional way of living. That's what the Epicureans were doing as groups. And they did it in Athens, and then it started getting transplanted to all sorts of other places as well. Question. Yeah. Um, so you said as groups, but the, the pleasure and the avoidance of pain yeah. Was it focused on you know, the practice uh, for you as an individual, more inward focus, or was there also an aspect where, and I don't mean like the intimacy kind of thing, but yeah, yeah. where you would, uh, where there was a, a part of it was the pleasure of the group or the pleasure of others? Or so it's both. It was both. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, that's actually a good segue into something else. So. The Epicureans would get criticized by a lot of people who, for, for a variety of reasons. And, and one of them was, you know, that 
it seems like all they're really interested in is pleasure and pain. That's kind of a piggish kind of life. That's one criticism. Another criticism is, well, what about morality, you know, right and wrong? You're only doing the right thing because it's pleasant for you. And then the, the other big criticism was, well, wait a second, what about friendship? If you're only friends with somebody because you get pleasure from them, you're not really friends with them for their own sake. You're just kind of using them, aren't you? And, and you know, if you're, if you're a selfish Epicurean, why would you care about your friend's pleasure? And so the Epicureans, um, they had responses to that. They'd say, listen, Epicurus actually says this in the Principal Doctrines, friendship is one of the best things in, the, in, in life. It's, it, it, and he had a couple reasons for it, well, some of which seemed kind of instrumental. Friendship helps you to not be afraid. Because you can think, I've got friends, so when I get sick or when, I don't know, there's a famine or something like that, I'll be taken care of and people won't come along and steal my stuff. So there's that part. But then he said, yeah, there's that, that's true, but there's also something intrinsically valuable about friendship. And, you know, friendship could be um, what we typically nowadays think of as a friendship where there's no sexual or erotic or romantic uh, aspect to it, but it could also include that sort of thing as well. That fell into the kind of relationship that they called friendship. Um, but it was for, I mean, was it for the benefit of me, or was there another aspect? Both. The benefit of the group? Both. Yeah. yeah, depending on who it was. I mean, you could be an Epicurean and be kind of a jerk, Epicurean, right? But then the other Epicureans would come along and, and be like, well, you're not really understanding the whole doctrine. You know, let's, let's, let's have another lecture and talk, something like that. Yeah. So if Epicurus thought that the cessation, the absence of pain, yeah. was pleasure, yeah. and that was one of the greatest pleasures, and he also felt that we should try to avoid pain as much as possible, because mm -hmm. that also is a good. How would you reconcile the fact that you can't avoid pain or pleasure from that unless you've experienced the pain? You oh, well, you've already experienced plenty of pains by the time that you're doing this sort of thing. You know, I mean, by the time that you're a child, you've already known what it's like to be wet, um, you know, cold, hungry, you know. Uh, and really, uh, there's, there's, we don't really know much about like how they were bringing up children or, or anything like that. Presumably, they're, they're, they probably had something, some sort of teaching for them. But by the time that you're an adult, you know, life is probably, unless you've been really, really lucky, life has probably given you enough stuff that you have a good sense of what you're trying to avoid. Um, and, and it doesn't just include physical pain; it also includes like um, fear or being upset about things, like being, being you know, angry all the time, or um, being sad. So, you know, I mean, it's kind of an interesting idea, though. Let's say you were a really, really, really successful Epicurean, and you started out when you were a kid, and you managed to avoid, like, every pain possible. So you have almost like a, just a book learning about, about them. And you're 80 years old at that point, right? Um, maybe by that time there's such dim memories uh, that the sort, of, the sort of issue that you're worried about would, would come up. But I, I don't think it did for most, most Epicureans. Um, I think they thought that the world knocks us around enough that we, we, we know what we want to avoid. You know, and, and we've probably screwed things up. So, like, you know, take, let's take the drinking and getting hungover thing, right? So I would imagine that probably most kids in ancient Greece probably did the same, similar things to what a lot of us did as kids and what kids still do today, which is get into mom and dad's wine and you don't know how much to drink or how to properly appreciate it and get drunk and then like the next day, you know, you, you want to die. Um, and everything's too loud and stuff like that. So I imagine there's probably a lot of those sort of situations. Or, you know, falling in love and having the relationship go to, go to pieces, you know. Um, and so, you know, the goal was to try to provide a refuge for, for the person from from how, how, you know, how crappy life was, if you don't manage your, your pleasures and pains properly. Um, 
And Epicurus, you know, he, he comes to be called, the title they use for him is Sotor, which means savior. They also use the word hero for him um, in his own time, not, not just later with Lucretius, who turns him into almost like a, a, a godlike saint figure uh, who's here to like help us not you know screw up our lives and Le uh, Lucretius is much more anti-religious than Epicurus <coughs> is, um, but Epicurus thought that you know a lot of people are are um, afraid of things they don't have to be afraid of, and that causes them a lot of anguish and and suffering, and it could also spill over to relations with others, right? If I if I'm in a relationship with with somebody and I'm constantly anxious, it probably is no fun for them, right? The decisions they make you make, you know, oh, I've got to, I can't go to this, this thing. What would happen if I go there, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, they have lives outside of the garden, right? I mean, where are they? Well, are they that's a good question. Or whatever? And Epicurus they, didn't. He, he didn't, but he, everybody yeah. else did, right? Well, for the most it, part. Right? For the most part there, were, there were some who, again, we don't know that much about these, these, these people. Um, but, but outside of Athens, yeah, anybody who is an Epicurean would probably have a day job. <laughs> and how would they do their day jobs? Would, would that be pain? Oh, would yeah, be yeah. Pain and then, so wouldn't they want to not work? Ideally, you want a day job that you like, right? Yeah. So if you, if you can get that, um, if not, then, yeah, it's sort of a trade-off, you know? I mean, let's say you're a working-class Epicurean today, you don't have the, the option of not working, right? And so you go to your, your job and maybe your boss is a jerk and the conditions aren't great and you're like, well, I gotta put in my eight hours of crap, you know, now so that I can enjoy my 16 hours of not crap later. <laughs> you know? it, it, it kind of varied by circumstances, I, I think. Uh, what's that? You can enjoy the money that you earn too, right? Exactly, yeah, I mean, that's exactly why you're doing it. Uh, if, if you're not being paid, you don't show up. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would the Epicureans think about someone who was a sadist? Well, oh. Yeah, or a masochist, <laughs> those two. So that's, that's, an, <clears throat> that's an interesting one. Um, the sadist would be more problematic than the masochist, yeah. right? Because if, if and this is, this is one of the, you know, the Saad was, was one of the people who, who called themselves a libertine, and the libertines, they saw themselves as a, a certain kind of Epicurean. This is, this is much later, in like mm -hmm. the 18th century. Um, yeah, Epicurus would say in doing that, you're, you're violating justice, which is bad. And justice is not some sort of cosmic absolute. It's it's the norms of the society, and it, but it's also a sort of you know comportments that you ought to have so that you can live with with other people. Um, he had some kind of weird arguments that I don't think a lot of people really buy, but Epicureans seem to about, um, you know, if you commit injustice, you can never really be sure you'll get away with it, so you're going to, it's not going to be a pleasant life for you because you always have to be looking over your back. I don't think that's the case at all. And I think the sadist is, is perfectly okay. fine. Yeah, they're, they're perfectly fine with that. But, you know, I think Epicurus would, would end up saying something along the lines of, listen, you're creating pain for other people, so that's bad. And, and it's, it's, it's pleasant in one way for you, but it's, it's a kind of inhuman pleasure, you know. Um, it's, it goes against, here they'd probably bring in, like, conceptions of human nature. And again, we're handicapped by the fact that we don't have too much of their, their literature. The masochist is a little bit uh, tougher. I mean, if you, so if you derive pleasure, there's two, really two kinds of masochism, right? There's the masochism of you get pain, and because of the physical pain you feel, you derive some sort of pleasure, usually sexual pleasure, from that. And then there is the aspect of um, uh, like humiliation or lack of agency or stuff like that. And they can be combined quite often. But you could be one without the other. And I guess an Epicurean, the, men, the, the mental one would be more problematic for, for them. Um, with, I guess with the pain thing, well, you just got your pain circuits miswired. Or something. <laughs> yeah, right. If, if, you, if getting you know whipped or something like that actually makes you feel pleasure, then you know apart from any sort of societal scandal it might create or something like that, maybe that the, the Epicureans would be like, oh, that's fine. You you got a weird body, you mm -hmm. know, compared to the rest of us. It'd be sort of like a, if people like enjoyed eating food that. 
well, I mean, most people like seafood. No, spicy. spicy. Oh, spicy food. Like, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that so, would be. So, so spicy food, like hot food, that actually is pain really, receptors. Yeah, yeah. It, so well, it's, but it so helps. Pain. But it also creates for a lot of people uh, a release of endorphins, too. Right. So, so euphoria. Yeah, yeah. So that, so that yeah. works. Yeah. <laughs> but the, being, going back to the masochism thing, being, uh, taking pleasure in being humiliated. They, I think they would they would find that problematic, you know. Um, that's a, you know I've never been asked that before. That's a, that's a good question. Um, Sorry. No, no, it's no, it's good. I, I, it's Put not, on the exam. Yeah. And <laughs> get some answers. So um, well, how are we doing on time? Oh, I, I need to talk a little bit about what happens after Epicurus uh, shuffles off this moral coil. I will mention too. Um, Epicurus uh, and the Epicureans, hard materialists. There's no soul, or if there is, it's just a bunch of atoms put together in certain ways. Um, so once you're dead, you're dead. And you might say, well, why did he have a will then? You know, Why did he care? He wanted to make sure that his legacy would, would survive and the way of life that he was teaching would continue to be taught. And that, that's what's in his will. Um, the other thing that I'll, I'll mention about the Epicureans as well is, um, they, so they're atomists, they're taking this idea from Democritus, everything that exists is just combinations of atoms, and they said it's falling in a void, that's a little bit different than our understanding of atomic theory, um, <laughs> but he, he said um, every once in a while an atom like goes a, a, a weird way, he calls this the swerve. There's actually a book out there called The Swerve that was published in the, I think the last 15 years or so, and it's talking about Epicureanism. Um, and it's kind of similar to, you know, he uses this to try to say that that's why we have free will. But it's free will on a very, very low level. It's hard to explain from an Epicurean perspective with the text that we have how, you know, more robust conceptions of free will as intentional behavior would really take place. But when you see people saying things like, well, everything on this macro level is determined, but at the quantum level, things aren't, it's very similar to what Epicurus was, was proposing when people try to derive free will from that. So he taught this, this, this comprehensive doctrine, and he had buddies who were sort of helping him out with it. Metrodorus was, was one of them. Um, Epicurus is the head of the school, but he had, he had three other people who were... Um, sort of lieutenants, I guess you could say, or, you know, XOs, or however we want to call it. So one of them is Metrodorus. Metrodorus, uh, he was from uh, Lampsacus, and along with his, his brother, Timocrates, um, he joins the, the school there. His brother falls out with, with uh, Epicurus and was one of the detractors. He says some bad stuff about him. And... Um, Metrodorus became like one of Epicurus's most successful popularizers. He, he was uh, like tireless in, in that. But then he, unfortunately, he dies uh, kind of young compared to Epicurus. He's, he's 53, um, and Epicurus would have made him his successor. Instead, he makes Hermarchus his successor. Um, we don't have any of his writings. We don't have any of Metrodorus's writings, unfortunately, either. Um, and then there was a, a third guy who was um, Paul, uh, Paulinus. Um, he was a mathematician, but a kind of weird one, because he supposedly wrote a book about geometry saying, you know, geometry doesn't have any proper foundation or stuff like that. So he's, he, it's a book of problems that, that he wrote. Um, but he was an Epicurean. And then there were, there were a number of other people who were in that group. One who I thought was kind of uh, interesting and I wanted to bring up is this guy, Kolotes. Um, he was, he's, he's known as a satirist. And he wrote a book, which again, we don't have, um, that it's, imp and it's, the book is called That It's Impossible to Live, to even li to live according to the doctrines of the other philosophers. So the idea is, you know, there's different, like, options out there. there you, you could be a Platonist. You could be an Aristotelian. You could be a, a Stoic. You could be a skeptic. You could be, uh, you know, a different kind of hedonist. You could be a cynic. Or you could be an Epicurean. None of these other options are any good. 
that must have been one hell of a book. <laughs> you know? I wish we, we had it because it would be interesting to see. And so the, this whole group is, is around him when he dies, and they're having kids, and they're passing on this thing, and they, you know, they, they, in his lifetime he instituted a thing that Epicureans still do today, which is on the 20th of each month they celebrate Epicurus. And interestingly, in, in antiquity, they, they wound up... So in one respect, they're very um, radical. You know, they're, they're doing all sorts of things that don't really fit into the rest of society. They're hedonists. They, they withdraw from politics as much as possible. They, they've got their own thing that they're doing. And on the other hand, they're very conservative in that they, they don't really deviate from his, his teachings. They don't add an awful lot more to it, as far as we can tell, uh, until, until you know, uh, later on. And um, again, unfortunately, we don't have too much of what they wrote. We do nowadays have a good bit by this guy, Philodemus, who was a later Epicurean philosopher. I mentioned Herculaneum, right? Herculaneum is this uh, place where Philodemus lived. And, you know, we've, we've got a library from Herculaneum of these, these scrolls, and they're big, and they're all kind of messed up. <laughs> and so when they first discovered them, about two, I think about, yeah, probably two centuries ago, they, they tried to unroll them, and it just, like, fell apart. And so they're like, well, we better leave these alone. And in more recent times, they, they've developed other ways of, of you know, either unrolling the scroll or not unrolling it and imaging it. So there, it's a long process. The first thing they did was like you, you wet them down and you unroll them very, very, very slowly, like almost a glacial rate. And then you, you photograph what you've got and then people would, would you know, write out all that stuff. And so some of that's been translated. So we have some of Philodemus's writings. The other thing that they're doing now is they're taking the scrolls themselves and doing, I think, x-rays of them and then using um, AI programs to reconstruct what's, what's on the scroll. So we may, in fact, wind up with um, some other lost works by Epicurus. Uh, or not. <laughs> you know, may all be stuff by just Philodemus, but it, it's kind of nice. In ancient times, the Epicureans, they got kind of a bad rap. Um, a lot of other schools of philosophy, and, and people who don't necessarily belong to a school themselves but are eclectic, um, the one school that they're usually unfair to is the Epicureans. And it could be in part because the Epicureans were very popular and had a lot of followers. Um, it was also, when it comes to the Roman stuff, there was this perception that we don't really want these, these hedonists um, running the show. Caesar was reputed to be a, a uh, Epicurean. Um, and, you know, we, we, well, he, was one, well, he was their guy, right? Well, they killed him. <laughs> so uh, in some respects, he was, he was quite popular. In other respects, he was, he was viewed as kind of a degenerate um, on, on several different accounts. Usually the arguments that are made against the Epicureans are pretty unfair. Um, you know, but it, it's, it's good in a way that they have them because we know more about the Epicureans from these authors like Cicero or Plutarch or Lactantius who are, who are criticizing them. Uh, we have these fragments about, well, they, they say Epicurus taught this and this and this, but we don't have it in any other text. So... It's kind of nice to, to have that. And Epicureanism more or less disappears from the scene as Christianity um, you know, becomes more and more important in, in the Roman Empire and other forms of pagan uh, worship and philosophy become more important. Stoicism had always been a major opponent, but as Neoplatonism comes on the scene, the Neoplatonists, they hate the Epicureans too. Um, so it's not just a, a sort of like, you know, decline and fall of Rome a la Gibbon sort of, sort of thing. Um, and and they, they disappear as a school. They're resuscitated in the Renaissance. And interestingly enough, it's a Catholic priest, 
who plays a big role in that, Pierre Gassendi, who you probably associate with gases, right? Because he was also a scientist. Um, he wrote some, some uh, works arguing for Epicureanism, as, not just as a moral philosophy, but as a, um, a, a natural philosophy. He's arguing for the atomist point of view. And it, it, you know, it starts to take off in the um, 1600s and 1700s. And by, you know, by a certain point, you can say that, at least among the educated classes, um, there was a revived Epicureanism, but not everybody agreed on what, what it meant precisely to be an Epicurean. Some of them, it was you know, sort of like just associated with a hedonism in general, which they called libertinism. Mm. Stoicism also made a revival around the same time too. And so they were often sort of opposed to each other. And um, I guess the, the only other thing to say about, about the, the revival is, so in the last 20 years or so, um, and I think largely because of the internet <clears throat> and, and its, its ability to connect people and provide um, texts and you know, uh, resources to, to people, there have been a number of philosophical revivals of what we call philosophies of way, way, philosophy a way of life. And it's not a radically new thing. Um, ancient philosophies were all philosophies bless you, as a way of life. Medieval philosophy was that um, a lot of modern philosophy, like Rene Descartes, is that, that there's Cartesianism as a philosophy as a way of life. Um, existentialism was was very much about that, um, and then you know there's some literature about that. Uh, the person who coins the term is this Pierre Adol, who is is late uh, 20th century, but um, none of them knew the internet. And the internet has made it possible for people to connect together and for people to self-publish, too, in, in ways that don't have the opprobrium in the past. Think back 30 years. If you had a book and you told somebody that you published that book yourself and it wasn't from a, a regular publisher, they'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah sure. And you're like, here, take a copy. And yeah, and they'd throw it right in the trash, right? Nowadays, that's, that's gone. So... Among philosophies as a way of life, Stoicism is bigger. That, that's had a massive revival in the last 15 years. But the Epicureans are like second when it comes to ancient philosophies that have been resuscitated. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the, the big people in that movement lives just uh, you know, south of here in the Chicago suburbs. Uh, he's got a book, uh, Cultivating the Epicurean Garden, um, recently, another book, uh, how to how to how to be an Epicurean, came out, um, which is you know it, it, it's okay, it's not, it, it's pretty good in some respects, and these are books that are aimed at people who want to try to live out that way of life now. So there there is a current day revival of Epicureanism going on, that's very different than what we think of as you know Epicureanism and food and drink and, and all that. And it's kind of a cool thing to, to see. Um, we're, we're now in a time where philosophy in general, I th I'd say, is kind of on the rise. It's an it's, it's a exciting time. Yeah. But, but I find it interesting that it was a Catholic priest, a priest or yeah. Catholic, who, who did the revival. Because aren't the Epicureans say there's no afterlife? I mean, you just, you're, you're done. There's no... Heaven and hell and, yeah. and all of that. I don't know. What, what did they did they say? There was a god, no gods. Well, the Epicureans thought there were gods, and the gods were blessed. They lived a wonderful life. They were immortal, and the reason they were blessed is because they don't care anything about what a stupid human beings are doing. Right? They don't pay any attention to what's going on down here. These are the regular Greek gods, that you think of. Well, they, I, sort of. I mean. You, you couldn't be Zeus in the way that we typically think of him and be blessed in the way the Epicureans are saying because the Zeus that we know is always getting himself in trouble with his wife by screwing around on her and then making kids that then he had to like worry about and adjudicate conflicts between the gods. You know, it's, it's a full-time job being a Zeus. These gods, they, they were the, the, the Greek gods, but think about the Greek gods with all of the negative aspects stripped away. And they have no, they have nothing to do, you know. 
And the universe just goes on perfectly well without them. And you might say, well, what, what's the point of them? And, and Epicurus would say, exactly. We don't have to think about them at all. <laughs> you know, They're just sort of models for us. They don't get angry. They don't get jealous. Um, now, it's going, so going back to the, to the Catholic thing. So there, you know, there were, we often think as if like, Christianity and Catholicism was this monolithic you know, way of, of life you know, that we, we call the church. There were, at any given time, if we dig into the literature, there was so much crazy stuff going on, just, just the every day-to-day -day stuff. Like Anselm, who is you know, a very saintly guy, um, become, becomes a bishop, and then he has to write all these letters to, to monasteries saying, you guys are screwed up in this way. And don't let that priest go to town because when he does, he gets drunk and causes a scandal. You know, so there's always like all this this stuff going on, and then there was actually quite a lot of intellectual freedom in, in some places. You know, um, and Gassendi took full advantage of that. And and usually when they're when they're doing that sort of thing, they they've got some way of finagling it. The same thing goes for the Stoics too, because the Stoics were <clears throat> were hard materialists as well. Um, but there were, you know, Christians taking up the Stoics, and so you you, you do a, you, you do kind of a synthesis, right? But you know, Gassendi was very attracted to this uh, natural theory of atoms, and not too many other people were were working with it. Um, so yeah, I, you know, there were some other people. Thomas Jefferson said he was an Epicurean. Um, it's kind of debatable exactly how Epicurean he was. He's kind of a he's kind of an eclectic figure himself, and and a, a bit of an outlier. But he you know he, he kind of fits into that. Um, yeah, Diderot, another another example. Dennis Diderot, um, Jeremy Bentham. He's you know that there we have utilitarianism. There's a much greater focus on the community, but he saw what he was doing as within the grand tradition coming from Epicurus, turning everything into considerations of pleasures and pains. Um, so, you know, they, 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 uh, they've always been a minority, um, and they've never been, you know, all the, the hedonists around. You can always find some just crude people who just want to get drunk all the time, and and enjoy themselves. Was, you know, back in the day, we were the guys who party, right? Um, somebody comes up to you in the parking lot and says, "Hey, you want to party?" Probably not an Epicurean, you know. <laughs> but um, you know, there's there's probably always going to be something like Epicureanism around, maybe under different labels. And the people who are practic practicing it now, just like the people who are practicing it back in the day and the people who were trying to use it in, say, the 17th century, they thought of it as a, a coherent way of living <clears throat> that would um, not just answer certain questions, but like guide you to having a happy life with, with other people, too. So, yeah. So uh, um, that's, that's probably enough from, you know, the presentation. What, what other questions or ideas does it provoke for you, this guy Epicurus and his progeny? So this uh, neutral state, yeah. which he finds to be the ideal state, just a little bit reminding me of like the Zen state, you know? For yeah. It's a little bit like that, right? Like in a, in, yeah, especially insofar as when you ask people, so one, one central practice in, in, in Zen Buddhism uh, Zen comes from the Chinese word Chan means meditation, right? So meditation has to be absolutely central in it. And you say, well, what the hell are you doing when you're meditating, <laughs> right? You're just sitting there doing, doing nothing. And now they're not doing it to, to like obtain pleasure or something like that. They're aiming at enlightenment. But, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of just like not getting yourself involved in what's happening over there. Or, you know, another thing too is uh, not like trying to like be the best meditator because that's that's work right <laughs> so i think a lot of people when they meditate uh and you know some of you who, who do it can can tell me i think a lot of people when they meditate they actually do it because they they enjoy taking that time out of the day and not having to screw around with any of the other bs that we're stuck doing <laughs> it's, it's pleasant yeah yeah i i, I had a uh uh 
an acquaintance who was a yogi uh, for a while, and I asked him, well, what is it like when you meditate? Because when I, I don't, I'm not a good meditator. I don't actually enjoy it very much because my mind is a little bit too, too active. Even when I, when I try to use like techniques and aids and stuff like that, I've never really been successful. But he was a very calm guy. And I said, so what's it like when you meditate? Well, you know, it's an ocean of bliss, you know? And I was like, are you, are you serious? <laughs> you know, I was like in my 20s at the time. And, and I was tempted to, you know, sort of call BS on that. So no, no, I'm, I'm really serious about it. That's, that's what it's like. But then again, I've been doing that for 15 years. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. I mean, for the Epicureans, there were techniques that they would use, mental techniques. Um to try to have a more pleasant life. Like you would take a certain time out of the day and um, you would think about pre previous pleasures that you'd enjoyed. And just, you know, don't try to force it, but try to, you know, get some more enjoyment out of that. Um, or you'd analyze your fears so that you can, you can dispel them. It's good things to do. These, these are not unique to the Epicureans, but... I can tell you one thing that's sort of a contrast. Um, for Stoics, one really central practice is what they call pre meditatio malorum these days. Uh, the Stoics didn't actually call it back then, but it's sort of caught on. It means like thinking about bad things before they happen, not to worry about them, but so that you're inoculated against them. You, you, you bring up in, in your mind the bad thing that you're worried about happening, and then you can see that it's actually, A, not that bad, that you have resources to deal with it, um, that you've made some you know, wrong assumptions about it. And then when you actually do face that thing, you, you often find, oh, it's actually, I, I can deal with this. this. This is not that bad. I may not even have any ne negative reaction to it. Epicureans don't do that because they're like, why the hell would you want to think about something painful before it happens? There's enough pain already in life. Just think about pleasant things. <laughs> so, so that's one where they're, they're, there's a big contrast between the two of them. You know, would they feel like going out in nature and experiencing nature would be yeah. a pleasure, wouldn't it? Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. It would be kind of like a new, maybe a neutral kind of pleasure. You just watch the waves come in. I mean, it could be, um, it could be both. Um, it's interesting. I taught a, um, a class for Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design last semester on um, philosophies as ways of life. And Epicureanism was one of the ones that we did. And, and I had that as one of the practices. I suggested them like a bunch of practices. Try this. And then I gave them like worksheets. Okay, you, you like keep track of what the experience is like for you. And then we compare notes later. And um, that's one that we tried. Going and, 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 you know, there's other ways to do it. With the Epicurean thing, you're really focusing on are you getting pleasure from it or not? And so they had to analyze the pleasures that they had. And some of it was just like, so my head is right on the river. So you can, you can go out and sit. And many of the students at my head still live in the area too. You can just go right out and sit and um, watch the waves of the river. Or you could just go down to the lakefront. And so some of them did that. And they talked about sort of, you know, that experience of you're not, you're not focusing on anything. Water's good for that, right? You're not focused on any particular thing that you're getting pleasure from, it's just sort of an overall sensation. But when the wind blows and it's nice out, because uh, at that point in the semester it was like early October, you know, and you've got the nice smells, which isn't always the case in the downtown, right? <laughs> if it's coming from the south side, then maybe it's, it's not that good. But, but when it's coming from other places, then you get these nice smells and all that. Those would be active pleasures, right? I mean, think about smell. When you smell something, you can only smell it for a very short amount of time, right? That's why we can get used to terrible smells, <laughs> fortunately. So, um, I mean, some of them really stick with you more than, than others. But the good stuff, um, we smell it, and then it, it dissipates. That's one reason, this is a total side note, that's one reason I think why some people put on too much perfume or cologne. Because they spray it on, and they're like, oh, I like the way this smells. And then they can't smell it on themselves, even though other people can smell it on them, like 10 minutes later, and they're like, I need another spritz, you know? And then you get in the elevator with them, and you're like, whoa, what is that? And they're like, well, what do you mean, you know? Uh, go ahead. I would 
an Epicurean today um, reconcile mental illness? Oh. Um, for example, mental illness where you're hallucinating. So yeah. reality is not what it really is. Yeah. You know, or, or you could say, in the case of that sort of thing, um, you could also have virtual reality, and you could have, like, um, well, I suppose if it's drugs or something, it would be hallucinations too, right? Um, if it's pleasant, it's still real. The pleasure is real. Um, most people with mental illnesses, it's not a lot of pleasure. It's more, you know, pains and anxieties and troubles that they're, they're having. And, you know, the Epicureans, um, they, they actually, it's interesting. They, in ancient times, not just the Epicureans, but uh, sort of across the board, including the medical profession, they, they thought of a lot of things that we nowadays um, wouldn't call mental illnesses. They saw, they saw a sort of continuum between um, moral vices and mental illnesses. Mm. So and one of the nexuses was, was emotion, right? So losing your temper too, too much. Nowadays, we send people to anger management, and maybe they do cognitive behavior techniques or something like that, or they give you, you, know, they give you some pills to change your brain chemistry. Um, but the, you know, the Epicureans, actually, they talked quite a bit about anger. Philodemus has a whole text on it. Um, the Stoics, the, the, the Aristotelians, the Platonists, they all, they all developed very robust um, ways of helping individuals change their, their habits, their, their assumptions, their reactions to things. And... Um, they use that, that, that notion of illness to be out of control with respect to anger. It was morally vicious, but it was also mentally, it was a mental illness. And, and they saw a mind-body connection, too. You know, Galen is a, a really an interesting guy in that respect. Um, you know, we don't buy into much of his, uh, like, humor theory, right? Nobody uses that in medicine anymore, thank God. But um, when it comes to the cognitive side of it, he was, he was pretty on, on point for quite a few things. Um, and, you know, I guess <clears throat> one of the other things we can think about, what if there was somebody who was mentally ill in, in such a way that they would never be able to not... Um, Let's take anxiety. They would never, because of their brain chemistry, they would never be uh, living a life in which they were free of fear. Right? Um, there weren't any like pills to give at the time, like Xanax or anything like that, uh, which is kind of a trade-off anyway. You know, people get over-medicated. It doesn't. It, it's not a pleasant life. But um, what would that be like if they were in the Epicurean community? It probably would would suck for them. But, you know, they could still do some Epicurean things. They could try to minimize the amount of fear that they're feeling or not, have, not, not feel the fear and then immediately react and do something that's going to lead to more pain later, like um, withdraw from relationships or things like that. And so, again, we don't, we don't really know much about this, but we can presume that something like that probably came up quite a bit in Epicurean communities, and then hopefully they would, they would try to work with the person, you know. And they were probably kind of a pain in the rear for other people to deal with, too. <laughs> you know, if you've got somebody who's got mental illness in your family, it's going to generate a lot of trouble and pain for, for you. But, you know, there's, there's ways to manage it so it's less, at least. Um, but they would be precluded from living the good life, you know. Yeah. I hope that Epicureans um, deal with an issue where you had to go through pain now to provide pleasure. Oh, well, that's, that's uh, they, they thought that was uh, the case a lot of the time. That's, in fact, where the virtue of courage or fortitude comes in. You take on stuff that sucks right now and is painful or disturbing, and um, it'll pay off in pleasure later, right? So, like, think about going to the gym. Uh, yeah, so, so you go to the gym, and when you're first going, boy, does it suck. You know, the workout hurts. You're, you're looking around at everybody else in the gym, and you're like, they're able to do these weights. Why can't I do it? So you, you feel embarrassed, and, you know, you're probably upset with yourself for having let yourself get out of shape and all that sort of stuff. 
And, you know, it's funny because, you know, I'm, I'm in the process of trying to get back in shape. We've, we've been members of the Wisconsin Athletic Club now for about two years. And, I, you know, I, I go regularly and then things happen, get sick or get, get too much work, and then, then I'm not doing it regularly. But, you know, I've done it long enough now that some, some stuff sticks with me. And so, you know, my wife will ask, uh, did you have a good workout? And my answer is, it was a workout. I'm not at the point where any of them are good workouts yet, where I, like, enjoy, you know, doing the exercises. But it doesn't suck, right? Whereas in the past, it really did. And, you know, maybe five years from now, I'll actually enjoy going to the gym. I like going in the sauna afterwards. <laughs> I like not working out, <laughs> you know. And I certainly do like um, being, you know, not being winded as I go up the stairs or um, not having any problem picking up boxes or things like that that I would have had problems with two years ago. So there's, there's pleasure that comes from that. But you have to put up the, the stuff that you don't like in order to get that, right? And, and study is like that, too. Um, there's a lot of things that we study that it's not enjoyable, but it's going to pay off for us later. Or the, the example about working, right? You go to, the, you go to your job, and you've got to put up with your boss, and they're, you listen to their stupid stories, and, you know, uh, fill out the, the forms that they want you to fill out that nobody will ever read, and you know, this customer, you know, complains about this. And then your, your reward is you get to go home and look in your direct deposit, because now everybody uses that, and see the money, <laughs> and, you know, do the things you want to do, right? So there, there's plenty of cases where you incur something painful in order to, either to not have more pain later on, or to enjoy some, some sort of pleasure. And, and the, the, you know, the working out is a good example of, I'm working out right now, as I approach 50, because I don't want to be 60 and overweight, and have, I already have some joint pain, I'd like to have less of it, and I'd like to feel more, um, like I'm up to whatever challenges life puts in front of me. I don't really care about my appearance that much. That I, you know, I left uh, at least a decade ago. Um, I'm never going to try to be ripped or anything <laughs> like that. Right? But I want, I want to not have pains later on, like um, not being able to do something with my kids that they'd like to do because I, I'm too out of shape. So yeah. Well, isn't one way of looking at it is you'll have a better appreciation. I mean, you can even oh, enhance yeah. the pleasures that you'll have later. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, you know how bad it can be, you know, <laughs> at work or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and pleasures can can like um, they're not all like discrete units, right? They can they can sort of play off of each other. Um, so you know, ideally, if, if if it's possible to harmonize pleasures, that's what you do as an Epicurean. So that you, you have an even more pleasant life. Yeah. Any other questions? Or? I think it's a little bit hard to be an Epicurean today just because we live really long lives. Oh, and, and we're interesting. And we toward pain, right, as we get older. Yeah. So our bodies break down, so we get more of that physical immediate pain. Just by... And people die. Healthy, and just by nature of yeah, aging yeah. to live, you know, to be... 80, 85, 90 That's an interesting point. Older. So that's really hard. Yeah. There's no way out of that. Anyway. Well, no, I think that's, that's a really good point. Um, I mean, we, we, we do, with what we know about the body now and about nutrition and health and stuff like that, if we, if we want to and we're not screwed by the genetic lottery, we, we, can, we can reduce a lot of the problems that people had in, in old age. But... People do live way longer, and so there's this, this twilight where it could be quite um, painful or upsetting. And we can also add, like, your friends all die on you. And, yeah. you know, I think about my grandma who died when she was 93. She, she didn't realize what sort of anguish she was causing to my aunt, uh, her daughter, where, like, every meal she'd say, why can't I just die? Everybody else is gone. And we'd be like, mm -hmm. we're everybody else, you know? And, uh, age group. Yeah, exactly. My and, mom and, like that. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that is an issue. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be having the, the best Epicurean life, you could say, but it could still help you manage 
with the life that you've got so that it's less painful, you know. And then maybe that's the best you can you can have, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then and then do what? Just like Yeah. Uh, then change to a different philosophy that's more uh, functional for that point in life. Yeah. There, there's a guy he gave a talk at Stoic. Full hedonist then. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's this guy who gave a talk at Stoic kind of a couple of years ago. Uh, a. a. Long, big, big scholar of Hellenistic philosophy. So he's done a lot of work on Epicureans and skeptics and Stoics. And I forget exactly how he portioned it out, but he was like, well, in this part of the day, I'm a Stoic. This part of the day, I'm a skeptic. <laughs> this part of the day, I'm an Epicurean. That's great. <laughs> Maybe that's the way to do it. <laughs> well, thanks very much for your, your questions. Thank you. and,